the specials, a bunch of young groups lit up the charts with a potent homegrown mix of British and Jamaican music. They brought with them a look that combined black and white street styles. It wasn't just Britain's first multiracial music, it was a rich and contradictory movement born of turbulent times and the growing pains of multiculturalism. And as two-tone bands toured the country, many in the audience were changed forever. The special surfaced in the summer of 1979, within months of Margaret Thatcher's election as Prime Minister. They seized their moment. It just threw me. It was just, it was superb. It was just, it, I suddenly thought, here is something that I can really, really hang on to. You just can't escape the message with the specials. You can't escape the specials. You couldn't then, and if you hear it now, you can't. After punk, the music industry was desperate to sign the next big thing. The specials were able to set their own terms. Instead of signing a deal for the group, they signed for their label, Two Tone. They soon launched other bands, including Madness, as well as The Selector and The Beat. Two Tone had a distinctive look and its own sound, a fusion of rock and ska. For the audience, Two Tone's inclusive message made it more of a movement than a fad. It was Two Tone that, for me, really consolidated the coming together of politics and music and youth voices for a new Britain. It all seemed to happen overnight, but Two Tone was actually weaving together strands of post-war popular culture that stretched back to the 1940s. The first Jamaican settlers arrived in Britain in June 1948. Among the 500 or so passengers on the Windrush, 20 listed their profession as musician. The new arrivals bought ska, a lively dance music like an inside-out rhythm and blues. Ska and the reggae which followed it would soon become as much a part of British music as Indian food became a part of British eating. I belong to that group of people who were born in England to the children of immigrant parents. Coming from the Caribbean, my, my mum brought a wind-up gramophone and we used to, we used to listen to 78s of Trinidad and Calypso. I grew up in Southall uh, in the 60s and 70s and there was a, a classical singer called Dansen and my dad used to love his stuff and it was all very kind of, oh, that kind of stuff. I was probably the only Asian in my whole area. You felt like you ought to like something deep and meaningful, but, you know, I'm, I'm a, I love pop music and it's, that's all that matters to me. I moved around a lot as a kid, mainly around London. Um, all over the place. You know, I was thought of reggae and ska and all that as British music, and I didn't really know where it was from. <laughs> it was just part of the pop firmament. Rico Rodriguez brought his trombone to London. In Jamaica, he'd played on some of the earliest ska tracks. Yeah, me left Jamaica 6 to 1 December. We were coming to England on a Jamaican ship in Car Banana. In Britain, he carried on recording with other Jamaicans. Later, Rico, along with Dick Cuthel, became sort of eighth and ninth members of the specials, recording and touring with them throughout their career. Like everything else, I had to come out and go and play. I used to do a lot of sessions with Dan the Livingstone, who did Message to You, Rudy. He was with the Trojan Records. He used to give me a few sessions. Stop your running around. Outside of West Indian communities, the biggest fans of Jamaican music were the original Skinheads. A message to you, Rudy. Skinhead had formed out of the hard end of mod, the football terrace boot boys, and the rude boy style from Kingston, Jamaica. Oh, 
or you might wind up in jail. Along with their love of reggae, the skinheads took both their too short trousers and their close cropped hair from West Indian immigrants. Skinhead reggae became a distinct and distinctly British thing. As a teenager, it was all the scar stuff. It was that was the era of 69, 70, all those great records coming through, the Desmond Deckers and stuff. But also, they used to go down Lewisham Market and get the Jamaican scar stuff as it came in. My mother was Jewish, I was from Dagenham. My father was Nigerian and went back to Nigeria um, after I was born. And I was adopted into a white working class English family. Because I was the only black kid, it was easier to be the mascot of the skinheads <laughs> than anything else. So, and I really, really liked their music. And they used to play ska music and long shot kick the bucket and some reggae music. And they were deeply into Tamla and, and soul. And so that's where I began hearing all those records. I mean, I came to black music in a way through white skinheads. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things that's really important to understand about this Brit skinhead reggae phenomenon was that it, it could quite easily coexist with a kind of antipathy, a hatred for, the, for, for black people. I mean, there were a few, you know, there always is the problematic presence of a few black skinheads. And of course, their sense of who they were after was qualified by their desire to, to, to engage in what they called then Paki bashing. But what exactly do you do when you see Pakistanis? Well, sometimes we eat them, sometimes we just leave them. Packies ain't so much your enemy, they're just like a pastime, aren't they? Packies. <laughs> just jump on them. It's not their colour, because, you know, the Jamaicans are all right. A lot of Jamaican mates. I mean, they don't like Pakistanis either. At that point, you know, we had grown up with the whole Enoch Powell sort of speeches. We'd grown up with the National Front. We were fully aware of um, our parents getting abused in the streets. In this country, in 15 or 20 years' time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Powell's opinions were off the scale of respectable politics, but they set the tone for racists and neo-Nazis who kept themselves visible through the 70s. They were usually skinheads in their ranks, and street style continued to get mixed up with street politics. In 1977, the National Front organised a provocative march through Lewisham in south-east London, an area inhabited by both poor blacks and poor whites. These were some of the ugliest scenes of violence London has seen this year. At the riot which ensued, it wasn't just fascists fighting anti-fascists for control of the streets, it was skinheads versus punks. It was very tribal, but, you know, I've got friends and it was a war for them. You know, if you came from the suburbs and your hair was blue, and you came up to town, man, you know, you were lucky to get out alive. And it was, but that's what I'm saying was interesting, because, you know, this mob I've met, some of them, their sort of teddy boy thing was a big thing at that time. And then suddenly this division, you know, like someone turn up in a pair of leather trousers, hold on, he's gone punk. So come on down along the way, now the song a little ways I would play. Mid-70s reggae no longer made much sense to skinheads, but punks were drawn to it. It was as though fast and trebly punk was the other half of unhurried, bass-heavy reggae. Punk groups started trying to fit the two together. We were really interested in the recording process because they made fantastic records in four-track studios, and that's where we were making our records. We used to try and copy the dub guitar, right? It was a reggae thing. In the studio, he'd have a repeat going, jink, 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 jink. But the white boy playing the reggae, he used to go, jink, 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 jink. So we would check, check out the little chops, and, and we would learn a lot of them. It was great. It was a great time. A lot of the encounter between punk and reggae took place at concerts for Rock Against Racism, which had been formed in 1976 out of indignation provoked by blues musician Eric Clapton. Despite being deeply in debt to black music, Clapton had made a speech in support of Enoch Powell, although he denies being racist. Rock Against Racism, the punk reggae interface, says that racism will not be an issue in this popular culture, that what makes this popular culture tick, what makes it work, what makes it beautiful, what makes it compelling, are all premised on the exclusion of racism from the public world that's there. Rock Against Racism built up from small concerts that would pair one punk group with one reggae group to the huge event at Victoria Park in Hackney, at which The Clash topped the bill. Everybody sitting around. 